Imagine your worst nightmare coming true. Scary, right? Well, for some people, it's a lot more terrifying. I live in a small town in the north. It's your cliche, everyone knows everyone. John's barbecue and grill is being held after church service on Sunday. Kids playing hopscotch with the other three kids their age. And of course, almost everyone is living the American dream. White picket fences surrounding a two-story home with their kids and dog. I say almost everyone, cause some of us aren't so lucky. Yeah, sure, you could say I had a rough childhood. It wasn't the worst though. I still had a roof over my head and food to eat and some friends. Well, behind my house, there are about 10 acres of land. Great for hunting, bad for getting lost. My parents, the kind souls they are, would let people hunt behind their house for free if they'd like to. Many people did. Of course, since it was free, the word went around town pretty quickly, and more and more people asked us to hunt. As more people asked, we obtained a reputation. Teens would say it's haunted, but the parents would make them hush up and be friendly. Of course, they were friendly. A town that is so worried about their own reputation, they get obsessed over every conversation. After working so hard, they wouldn't let their children soil it. The first Saturday night I returned home for winter break was easily the most horrifying experience I had ever witnessed. During my freshman year of college, I finally caught a break. A winter night, colder than an icebox. Well, that's expected. It's winter in the north. I was pretty bored and decided to call my friends to hang out. I called Sammy, Charles, and Alex. That was a mistake. Sammy, Charles, and Alex were all bored and thought, why not? They came over to my house, and after watching a few movies in the living room, we all were bored. We tried playing Monopoly, but Charles cheated and ruined the fun. Sammy jumped up like a kangaroo and asked, do you want to go back into the forest back there? Explore a little? No way. First of all, it's way too cold out there. Secondly, we could get lost super easily. It's snowing, so we would probably lose our tracks and never find our way out. And what if there's ghosts? You know the reputation it has, Alex exclaimed. Relax, Alex. We don't know if there's any ghosts there or not. Besides, we can just take some string or something so we don't get lost, Charles replied. Well, it'll be fun, right? Just a few minutes in there, we'll be fine. We won't get lost. I tried to convince myself it would be fun, although I had always hated my backyard. I'm not a kid anymore. I can face my fears. Plus, the rumors were just immature teenagers trying to scare each other, right? Danny, are you serious right now? You hate that forest, Alex replied. I know, I'm not a kid anymore. I can handle it. Plus, those rumors must have been just rumors to scare each other. The last time I went into that forest was two years ago. I didn't see anything noteworthy, I said. Okay, fine, I'll go. But if we see anything, I'm the first one out of there. Got it? Alex said. Great. Yep, got it, Charles replied. Okay, I said. I may be scared, but I'm not going alone. It'll be fine. Yeah, it'll be fun. I grabbed four spools of thick string, green, red, blue, and yellow, and four flashlights. We were walking outside when we realized how cold it was. I checked my phone. The weather app says it's only 20 degrees Fahrenheit, but it felt like maybe 12 degrees, if not less. The snow was up to our ankles. Luckily, we had boots. It felt as if we were standing in a thick slushy. Can we please hurry this up? I'm really cold, Alex said. Yeah, aren't we all? Sammy, Charles, and I replied. We continued walking until we got to the tree line. There were trees of all different sizes, large, compact, lanky, narrow, overgrown. Any type of tree you could think of, it was there. 
The numerous branches had thick, fluffy snow on it. It was dark outside. In the forest, it was always dark, though. The innumerable branches blocked any light from the moon and stars. Today was no different. I don't know why, but it felt much more isolated tonight. If it wasn't for my friends, I wouldn't have even gone close to the tree line, let alone actually go into the forest. Well, time to get this over with. I gave everyone their respective string color. Sammy blue, Alex yellow, Charles red, and me. I had green. I tied the strings to a tree, then to the person. The strings would allow us to go about 3,000 feet into the forest. That was more than enough for us. As we all know, it's colder than an ice bath, I said. Yeah, it's an ice box out here. I can feel my bones forming ice flakes, Charles replied uncomfortably. Sammy snickers as Alex frowns. Well, which way are we going? Want to split up? Sammy suggests. Are you serious? I finally agree to come out here, and you're already joking? Alex replies, disapprovingly. Oh my, Alex, take a chill pill. It was a joke. I wouldn't want to lose you in this forsaken forest. We'll stick together, so let's hurry up and get walking, Sammy says excitedly. We start walking, but going very slow due to the abundant amount of snow. We're only about 20 feet from the tree line, and the amount of snow has doubled. It's now at our shins. Well, I hope there isn't any additional snow further in. It's pitch black, so I handed everyone a flashlight. We continued walking until we hit a shallow river. Must have only been a few inches. I've never been this far into the forest. I assume we're about 200 feet in by now. My nose and ears are freezing, and I could barely feel my hands through my leather gloves. What is that? Alex says shakily. She sounds as if she's on the brink of tears. What? What's wrong? What do you see? I turn around to try to find her, pointing my flashlight in her direction. I almost dropped my flashlight. Alex has already dropped hers. Charles and Sammy mutter under their breath. Oh no. A spindly, humanoid creature is crawling on the riverbank. It had penetrating yellow eyes, a mouth with teeth so sharp and decayed. The top of its head is caved in and appears to have some sharp teeth protruding out of it. The limbs were nothing but bones covered in pale white skin. Our flashlight stopped working. What is that? We dash toward the tree line. It's so hard to run shin deep in snow. Was I just imagining that? Nothing in the world looks that scary. Is the icy weather getting to my head and causing hallucinations? I felt my heart beginning to race and my head ached. My whole body felt uneasy and lightheaded. Alex, Sammy, Charles, where are you? I yelled. I could barely see. Danny, is that you? Charles came out, leaning against the tree for support while trying to catch his breath. Yeah, it's me. Did you see that thing? Are you okay? Where are the others? I felt like I was about to have a heart attack. Are they okay? Did that thing take them? I don't know what that was. We need to go back and search for Sammy and Alex. A voice came out of the forest. Don't worry, we're fine, Sammy replied. Both Sammy and Alex came out, holding each other's hands. Alex, just like Charles, was propped up against a tree for support. Let's get out of here. I ran as fast as I could in knee-high snow. I saw something in the corner of my eye. Is that a man in a cloak and a top hat? No. The weather got to my brain. I'm seeing things now. I arrived at the sliding glass back door. Hurry, I yelled to Sammy and Alex. Once they entered, I slammed it shut, locked it, and closed the curtains. I ran to turn on the heater and put the teapot on to boil. We were all in hysterics. That thing must have been a malnourished coyote. Nobody wants to talk about it. Yet, I guess that's understandable. 
I don't want to interrupt the silence. Everyone just needs to gather their thoughts and calm down. Well, don't just stand around here. What was that? Sammy cried. I, I don't know. Obviously, it was something like a ghost, Alex replied. I'm going home. Sorry, Danny. I can't stay here, Charles said. Yeah, I'm going too. Good night, Danny. Stay safe, Sammy declared. W wait please don't leave me here alone. They can't just leave me here alone with that thing, can they? I'm going with Sammy. I'm sorry. Bye, Alex said, sounding panicked. So, they're just going to leave me, just like that. How could they? Fine, I'll just stay here. It can't get me inside here. With the sounds of the door closing, the teapot whistles, sounding like a baby bird screeching for food. I poured myself a cup of water and put in tea and honey. I walk upstairs, sit on my bed, recounting what had just occurred. As I lay there, it feels more and more lonesome. I decide to visit my parents' old bedroom, expecting the dark hardwood floors with matching furniture, a paper white bedspread with floral laces on the edges, Pictures framing the walls with photographs of all the places they have traveled to. Man, I miss them. I miss their sweet vanilla scent. It's only been seven months since their passing, but I still think about them every day. When I'm about to open the door, it hits me. This intense feeling of dread is clogging my senses. As I look up, I see it. Crouching on the bedspread is that thing. The thing that we saw in the forest, its eyes still that soul-stealing yellow. My head feels like it's about to explode. I feel nauseous, but I can't move. Why can't I move? Someone, please help me. I need to get out of here. I try to lift my leg, but nothing comes of it. After what seems like an hour, I can finally move. I bolt to the bathroom, almost tripping my way there. It's here too. This time, it's standing. A hungry look on its face while it reaches out its hand. Those fingers. I can still envision those long, skinny fingers. Attached to them were nails that were sharp as an ice pick. Its skin looked as if it was melting off. I could see the bones under its melting skin. Under the pale white skin, it was red. I ran to my room. Luckily, it's not in there. I hid in my closet. That's where I am now, writing this. I can hear it prowling around looking for me. I know it will eventually find me. This series of supernatural events I'm going to recollect to you has been kept extremely confidential and non-disclosed for a good 15 years. I was involved with this particular case back when I was a rookie, only being an officer for about a year and a half. All areas and people I will refer to in this story have had their names changed to protect their identity as well as my job. The first time I was introduced to this case was when my partner and I were called to investigate a missing person. The person who I will refer to as John was a camp host for one of the campgrounds in our local forest which was a part of our district. The person who reported him missing was a middle-aged woman who worked at a local lodge. We asked her a few basic questions, such as how long he had been missing, which were about two days, and how did she know he was missing. She told us that he would always come to the lodge for a pack of smokes each morning, and had been doing that for the past two months. So when he didn't show up for two days in a row, she became suspicious. I then asked her how he acted, and her response intrigued me at the time when she said, John was the quiet type, not saying much to anyone other than the occasional hello. He never brought food or supplies here, and I didn't find out why until one day I offered him a free gallon of milk that was about to expire the next day, and he gave me a disturbed look as if I was trying to give him poison. I soon figured out that he didn't trust food that he didn't make himself. He was extremely antisocial, and I wouldn't be surprised if he went off to live in the woods by himself. 
She answered a few more questions pertaining to the case, but nothing I need to inform you about. Soon after we finished questioning her, we went to go check out the campground he was in charge of, which was only about five miles from the lodge, but on a winding dirt road that went up the side of a mountain. When we first arrived to the campground that John was in charge of, we noticed that it had not been well kept and maintained. The fire pits were full of ashes, and the bathrooms looked as if they hadn't been cleaned for months, with many different substances and graffiti coating their walls. After we surveyed the other campsites and introduced ourselves to the families who were camping there, we went to visit the man's trailer, which was isolated at the end of the loop. Surprisingly, his campsite was clean and had been taken great care of. It was when we entered the man's trailer that the smell hit us. It stunk so bad that I expected to find him rotting away in there, but he was nowhere to be found. I tried to turn on the lights to see better, and they flashed on for a fragment of a second, but quickly went out. That's when I realized the smell must have been coming from the fridge. Everything inside must have spoiled due to the power being out. I went over to open it, but wish I never had. Because when I did, the gust of wind that came from within it literally caused my eyeballs to burn. Being blinded for a moment, I bent over and rubbed them frantically. My partner came over wondering what was wrong when his eye caught what was in the fridge. Oh man, that's disgusting, he muttered as I lifted my head to see what he was looking at through my red eyes. There in the fridge was a carcass of a squirrel, a few birds, and lastly, what looked like chopped up pieces of deer that still had fur attached to it. Everything was rotting away, and the flies that lingered in the trailer swarmed the fridge with my partner, who I'll refer to as Daniel, quickly shut. We briefly looked around to see if there was any evidence that could give us a clue what happened to this man. Right before we were about to leave, I saw the edge of what looked to be a book poking through underneath the mattress. I grabbed it and walked out of the trailer to escape that dreadful smell that had my eyes still burning and watering. The book felt cold in my hand, even though the sun was blazing. Upon opening it, I felt the world around me seem to stop as the wind came to a halt. Even the birds stopped chirping. Do you feel that? Daniel asked me as he looked about. What? I replied, wondering if he felt the same silence that I did. Can't really explain it, but I feel as if something's watching us, he said as his head twisted about. I don't know if my mind was playing tricks on me but I felt that same eerie feeling. Yeah, and did you hear everything go silent? I asked back, wondering what was going on. Uh-huh, let's report back to the chief and get out of here, he said while walking back to the vehicle. We then heard a raspy whistle cutting through the silence that caused us to quicken our pace trying to leave the area as fast as we could. Glancing at the book in my hand, I wondered what to do with it. I was supposed to turn it in as evidence, but decided to hold on to it for just a bit before turning it in. I was honestly curious to see what type of book this guy had because of how unusual he seemed to be. Looking back now, I wish I would have just turned it in as evidence because what I found inside was sickening to the very core. While my partner Daniel drove us back into town, I started to read the book, which I soon found out was actually the man's journal due to how everything was handwritten and some pages had illustrations. It was all unsettling and off the bat. I could tell this man had some demons lurking inside of his head. I will go more into depth with what was written and drawn in the journal later, but as of now, I need to state that the chief that's over my department ever found out that I stole this journal and then disclosed the details of the case online without prior consent, then I could risk losing my job. So I hope no one recognizes this, because this case involved many people whose experiences and testimonies of what happened will be shown. Anyway, when we get back to the station, we had already reported everything we found out about this man over the radio, and they were able to properly ID him. The strange thing is that they didn't have much on him, since he'd been out in the woods for so long. He only had one living relative left, that was his mother. 
The only thing that we were able to pull up under his name was that when he was 13, he accidentally burned down his parents' house during the night due to unknown reasons. One account states that he said he was performing a ritual of some sort. Satanic or not, this missing person was unlike any person I had ever investigated since. Continuing to the main subject matter, this case involving the camp host has been by far the most mysterious case I had ever investigated. Everything that had happened up to the point of when I stole the journal was the only shallow part of the story. But little did I know that I would soon find myself in the deep end of the pool. What we found out there could cause any sane person to have a mental breakdown. This was only the beginning of a nightmare. To continue after the first part of this, I'm going to be showing you the account we received from one family in particular who were staying at the camp when the camp host supposedly went missing. This conversation was recorded and then transcribed and is shown below. Officer Daniel, did you notice anything strange before the camp host went missing? Such as did you see anyone else roaming around his campsite or anything suspicious? The Mother, well, when we first got here, we tried to introduce ourselves to him, and he just ignored us until we left. He seemed mentally unstable and unfit to be maintaining this campground, and was often whistling with a raspy, uneven tone, which got annoying when we were trying to enjoy the sounds of nature. Also, one weird thing that was during one of the middle of the nights, we heard something that sounded like hammering coming from outside our tent. My husband went to investigate, and we found the camp host chopping firewood next to a roaring fire, and it was about 3 o'clock in the morning. That was the last time we saw him, and there were many other strange things that went on around the camp host's campsite. Officer Daniel, did he seem intoxicated at all during any of this? Maybe he was unstable. The father, we tried to avoid him the best we could so we aren't exactly sure if he was drunk or anything like that. Officer Daniel, is there anything else that you saw that we should be aware of? The teenage son, I don't know if this pertains to this case, but I went hiking with my younger sister up the side of the mountain over there, and while we were hiking, we found something. Officer Daniel, what did you find? The teenage son, well, you see, I'm not exactly sure what it was, but someone had definitely been doing something up there. Officer Daniel, describe it please. The teenage son, we found a patch of trees that had bones strung up in their branches as if someone had tied it to them. In the middle of the patch of trees were rocks that were placed in a strange circular type thing, and in there was a straight stick that held what looked to be some animal's skull. Around the circle posted on the trees were pictures of people. I'm going to stop at this point in the interview because he had many questions that were not essential to know, but what the teenage son had hiked in on was what we investigated next. By the time we were interviewing these people, search and rescue had gone out into the forest, but never found him. They did find some random cigarette butts mixed in the dirt which tied back to him buying a pack of them a day from the lodge. So they thought they were close to finding him. However, they still couldn't trace exactly where he went. While search and rescue were doing this, my partner and I were in charge of investigating the place that the teenager had described to us. When we finally found it based on the description of how to get there from the boy, we took pictures of the area. It was a strange place and the random pictures of people posted on the trees, all angled to where any of them could be seen if you stood in the middle of the rocks. I examined the photos, trying to see if I could recognize any of the people, when Daniel said, Isn't that the girl that went missing in the woods last summer? Walking over, I examined the picture, and it matched the photo of which our police department put in the newspaper, wondering if anyone had seen her around. Yeah, that's the girl. But why would someone put her picture here? It just doesn't make sense to me. You don't suppose that these are all pictures of people who have gone missing? Daniel asked as he looked around. Only one way to be sure. Let's take a picture of each one and send it back for analysis. Maybe this is some weird shrine someone created, or it could just be a trophy shelf of someone's victims. 
Who knows, we might just soon find a picture of the man we are looking for, up in one of these trees. I responded while brushing my stubby beard. Daniel agreed, and we photographed and documented the area. While we sent this information in, I decided to read some of what was written in the man's diary that I had taken from his trailer. It was a random disturbing segment in a page from it, and it goes as follows. I need to appease it somehow, but I can't. It's following me everywhere I go, and there's near nothing I can do about it. Every time I feel it get close behind me, I dart around, and nothing's there. I see people in camp smiling and having the time of their lives, not knowing of the evil I have just done. This is what I couldn't understand in the man's writing at the time, was that he seemed as if someone or something was trying to get him, but there was no evidence proving that this was true. There was no forced entry into the man's trailer, it was as if he just vanished without a trace. Later, Daniel and I were notified about who the pictures were of, and the answer was mind-boggling. Every single one of those people had gone missing in that forest area, ranging from 20 years ago all the way up to present day. Either someone was being insensitive and made this, or this could be a trophy case of someone's victims whose disappearances were all blamed on going missing in the woods. All I knew at the time was that this case was beginning to grow far past than just the simple missing person. Sometimes one person's perspective is completely different from the other, even if they are observing the same thing. That is one rule I learned while being an officer. Always be prepared to know that you aren't prepared at all. For this post in the series, I'm going to read another submission from the missing person's journal that at the time of when this occurred, gave me more insight to what truly happened to him, but still there lingers a mystery in the crevices. John's journal entry a month prior before going missing. My mind spins at the possibility of what I can do now that I have finally found the ingredients needed. I write this in here as my heart races with excitement of the powers I will soon possess, on the things I'll be able to do when I gain the strength of ten men. However, this ritual is still unclear and could backfire terribly, but I will obey the rules given and not cross my boundaries or lines. My life depends on it. Next entry was the night before he supposedly went missing. What I have done jumping into something so stupidly, having people around, and to be caught off guard as I was. The ritual was going perfectly until that camper came to complain to me about chopping wood in the middle of the night for the fire. He slowed me down and I wasn't able to place the piece of wood in the fire at the exact time for everything to work properly and now I've unleashed a shadow beast into these woods. One made up of human misery, born from flames who can only go by the same. But as soon as it arose from the flames, it inhumanly darted into the woods, escaping the words I tried to mutter out to cease it from existing. But now there is nothing I can do to stop it. Its hunger for a host is unquenchable. I know that soon it will come for me, but I will be the first of many. If I do not write again, I bid this cruel world farewell. This was the last entry in the journal, but the last one I showed you in the previous post where he wrote about being followed. So furthermore, these are some of the last sentences he's ever written. That thing is trying to get me, but I have no idea what it wants. It wanders close to me at night, out of sight waiting for me to lay down my guard, but it could have got me many times already, but it hasn't and I truly don't know why. The only thing that I can imagine is this thing wants to take over me, possessing me and gaining complete control of my actions. Soon after, it would commit the most heinous crimes that anyone could imagine. If this would happen, it would probably destroy the shrine I made to pay respect to the ones who've gone missing, to the wandering spirit I unleashed into the same forest about 20 years ago. All of those people gone because of me, and I fear that if I don't maintain that shrine, they will come back to haunt me. I have dug myself a hole too deep to get out of, and now I pay the consequences. If someone finds this journal after I am gone, then you need to understand this. That thing won't rest no matter what, and can only be eliminated by fire. Torch the forest for all I care, if that's the only way you can eliminate it. Also, if I end up missing, whatever you do, don't go looking for me. 
because it won't be me. After reading that last sentence for the first time, my body ran cold, but my young instincts kept reminding me that most of the things that this guy wrote in his journal didn't make any sense. So, as one of the pages had nothing but gibberish scribbled on it with pictures of a human goat thing with a long, snake-like tongue. So I took everything he wrote with a grain of salt. In general, the book as a whole just gave me bad vibes every time I held it or dealt with it. After I finished reading through it and trying to understand everything this man was talking about, I slipped the journal in with the other evidence involved with the missing person's case. No one even noticed because this forest was known too often to have people go missing, which meant that cases like this one weren't a priority. However, all these people going missing made me think about when John wrote about releasing a wandering spirit into the woods, and he made that strange shrine that the teenager stumbled upon to try to appease the spirits of the people who were taken by it. In my entire life, I never would have thought that something this dark could occur in my hometown where I spent the majority of my youth playing in the same woods, because there's not much else to do in a small town like this one. Being involved in this case made me never want to do anything outdoors again, because who knows what's lurking out there, among the trees. All of this seemed so crazy to me at the time, and the time and effort put into the case was all meant to find some lunatic who believes conjuring spirits and gaining powers through rituals and other strange things like that. Again, I was a young rookie at the time, and now I fully understand that there's something in this world which are best left alone and untouched, because for all you know, you could be getting yourself into trouble with a much deeper force than you could possibly imagine, like John did. The next post will be my last of this personal story of mine, because I fear that my coworkers and other people I haven't told you about yet will catch on to this and know it was me who disclosed the information to the public. This will be the last post involving this personal story of mine because I've already been hearing rumors at work about somebody who's leaking private information involving a case, but I'm not sure if they think it's me or someone else. The best thing for me to do is to end it here and lay low for a while, but I hope the chief from my department is not reading scary stories posted on the internet so he won't find this. With that out of the way, I must tell you how everything went down those last fatal days when my partner and I were still working on the case. With the days passing by and no strong evidence showing what truly happened to this man being brought to the table, this case was going to become cold and even given up on, and he would just be another missing person ad in the newspaper. At the time, I was sick of dealing with this case, mainly because after we first went into this man's trailer, I looked into his journal and there had been strange occurrences and sensations that I felt randomly. Some chilled me to the back of my spine. This whole case was going down a rabbit hole leading everywhere but nowhere all at once. We also had a cleanup crew go through and take down the shrine of the missing people's faces. They threw away the stuff in the trees and scattered the rocks formed into a circle, leaving the area in its original state. While they were doing this cleanup, there were reports of hearing voices mumbling to them, but so quietly they couldn't understand what was being said. However, there was one thing that every single one of them heard clear as day, and it was someone who was whistling in a raspy, uneven tone. It started with one of them supposedly saying something like, Hey, if you can't whistle right, then shut up. Everyone was thinking one of them was doing it. But during their lunch break, when everyone had food in their mouths, they heard it again. That's when they decided to cut their lunch break and clean the rest of the area up, because all of them felt uneasy being there. It was after hearing those accounts that the light bulb clicked in my head. The family we questioned when the man first went missing told me that he had an annoying whistle. But the hairs on my neck stood up when I remembered hearing the faint whistle when we were walking back to our vehicle after searching his trailer. This guy must have been playing tricks on us for his own amusement and probably enjoyed seeing us get all turned around while trying to figure out what happened to him. I told Daniel my story and he was skeptical at first but soon understood where I was coming from with my argument. We told the chief and he told us to investigate one last time during the night and watch the missing person's campsite to see if he's not sneaking back in the middle of the night. 
The deal was that if we found him, the case would be dismissed. But if we didn't see anything, the case would become cold and all investigation involving it would be terminated. We agreed and drove back to the woods to stay the night patrolling the area. It was a night that would scar me for the rest of my life. While we were patrolling the area before the sun fully hid behind the mountains, we talked to a few of the campers staying on the campground and they seemed distressed. We asked them what was wrong and they said they kept hearing some whistling but couldn't figure out where it was coming from. Even when they walked down to the lake, it seemed to follow them. And because of this, they planned to cut their vacation short and get out of here. It probably made them feel more paranoid after hearing about someone go missing here in the past week, especially when they were constantly seeing officers from search and rescue. I responded saying, if I were in your shoes, then that would be exactly what I would do too. We talked a little longer, but Daniel insisted that we needed to keep a better eye out for the man, just in case he returned. I understood, and we drove to where we could see the man's camp trailer, but were still well hidden. That's when the waiting begun until midnight. The full moon illuminated the ground, causing our visibility of the man's trailer to still work out without the need for a flashlight. As we were sitting there, we noticed a few pine cones falling from the trees nearby and bouncing off the ground below. You think that's either a squirrel or a chipmunk knocking those down? I asked while stretching and letting out a yawn. It could be. I've seen chipmunks knock them down quite often. Daniel responded as we gazed at where they were dropping. That's when we heard something snap and saw a large branch fall from the same tree the pine cones were coming from. That has to be a bear cub or something to break a branch that big. I stated, wondering what was up there. If that's the case, then we have to get it out of the campground so it won't hurt anyone. Daniel said as he opened his side door and grabbed his heavy duty flashlight, big enough to be considered as a weapon, and shined it at the tree. I couldn't see exactly where he was shining because I was still in the vehicle, but Daniel pulled out his weapon and started screaming, Sir, get out of the tree now! I wondered what was going on, so I got out and saw where Daniel steadily held his flashlight. How, how did he get up there? The words fell out of my mouth as we watched the man we were looking for at the top of the tree, clinging to the base. He didn't move at all, but his eyes were illuminated by the flashlight and reflected bright red. Sir, I won't tell you again. Climb down from the tree, or if you're incapable of doing so, please let us know. Daniel yelled with droplets of spit falling out. The man didn't respond, but just stayed put watching us intensely with those glaring eyes. Suddenly, the man jumps from one tree to another, and that's when we notice that all he's wearing is some tattered, dirty blue jeans. Daniel opened fire trying to get him down, but the man was so swift with his movements that Daniel wasn't able to land a shot. Let's follow him, Daniel screamed as he ran after the man. I followed closely behind with my weapon drawn, wondering what was wrong with the man. Briefly, we could see him jumping from tree to tree, and we continued after him slowly, going deeper into the woods. Where did he go? I said while breathing in gulps of air. I don't know. You hear that? Daniel asked as he glanced about. Listening closely, I could hear the faint sound of someone whistling. He's got to be close by, Daniel stated firmly while tightening his grip on his weapon. Closely listening to the raspy, uneven whistling, I said, It's getting louder. That must mean he's... Out of nowhere, the man pounced from one of the trees on top of me. He was trying to bite me, but I held him back the best I could, but his strength seemed inhuman. Daniel quickly shot the side of him, which caused him to dart off into the woods, and he was hunched over, grabbing his wound just running as if nothing happened. You okay? Daniel quickly asked as he helped me to my feet and said, Hurry, we can't lose him. I agreed and we followed his bare footprints in the dirt that led to an open field covered in dry yellow grass. In the middle of the pasture, we noticed a dark spot. Shining our lights at it, it was the back of the man. Slowly but swiftly, we made our way over to him. But when we got there, we saw that he was shaking and I asked sternly, Sir, Please restrain yourself. We aren't trying to hurt you. The man's eyes darted at me, and he muttered, Run. That thing left me to rot and is in search for a new host. Get out of here while you still can. 
We need to get you out of here. We're not leaving. Now please explain why you tried to attack us. Daniel asked sternly, not knowing everything that I knew about this man's dark past at this point. The man's eyes, who were staring me down slowly, started to move and stare at something just past me. Not looking behind me, I grabbed Daniel's arm and quickly yanked him towards where we came from. He restrained and pulled his arm from my grasp, saying, What are you doing? We can't just leave him here. Not knowing what to do, I looked back at Daniel and saw a dark figure standing about five feet behind him. There's something right behind you. I screamed, trying to pull my weapon that seemed stuck in its holster. Daniel then said, turning around, What do you mean there's something? As he looked behind him, the figure stayed still. Daniel drew his weapon and looked back at me, and I could sense fear in his eyes. The man on the ground began muttering nonsense words, which seemed to anger this thing, which suddenly disappeared. That's when the man on the ground started to kick his feet and scream. Daniel looked at me, and somehow read each other's mind as we both darted back to the vehicle, leaving the man there. As we ran, we heard the screaming stop, but not waiting for anything, we jumped into the car and drove back into town. We got on the radio and reported back to the station on everything that went down, and they seemed in disbelief. As we got back into the station, there were people I had never seen there before, dressed in dark suits, that interviewed us on what exactly happened. And once it was over, they made us promise not to tell anyone else about it. After posting this, I guess I just broke that promise, but it is what it is. Later, I found out they closed the campground down, saying that it needed to be refurbished. And soon after, there was a mysterious fire that swept the area, burning everything into ashes. In the newspaper, it was blamed on a butt of a cigarette that was tossed into a dry grass field. I knew that that was a lie and that there was an intentional burning. The fire was meant to eliminate that thing, but I don't think it worked because a week later, someone went missing in a part of the woods nearby that was untouched by the flames. We never solved this case because technically, the man is still missing, but I'm never going back into that area again. It's been 15 years since I was last there and I will go the rest of my life avoiding it. Some places need to be avoided the same way some things don't need to be understood. I will finish by saying that if you see a campsite closed, and it says that there's maintenance going on, don't believe it. For all you know, there could be another beast lurking in the mist. Be safe out there. I'm a 17-year-old guy, currently living in Phoenix, Arizona. This incident took place around six months ago on an overnight trip into the Superstition Mountains, which are about an hour drive east of Phoenix. I'm not going to specify the exact trail because I've been doing this stuff long enough to realize what happens when you post stuff on the internet. Whether it's a good trail, abandoned mine, ghosts, or whatever it may be, people come flocking and usually with a lot of trash and loud music. Anyway. This particular trail I was taking was an 8 mile loop through a canyon, pretty simple in and out overnight trip. I had planned to go with my friend, but a last minute cancel on his part left me on my own. So with a packed bag and my car ready to go, I decided to go on my own. Not leaving the house on time and some trouble navigating rough forest roads, I didn't arrive at the trailhead until around 5.45. Which, for those of you who don't backpack, this is a very big no-no. I had about a four-mile hike until I arrived at my planned camping spot. And it was getting dark fast, so I figured if I moved quick enough, I could get at least two to three miles in before I had to find a spot. This strategy left me hiking a very dark trail on my own, with about 15 miles of dirt road between me and anyone else. Hiking in the dark by itself is scary, especially for where I was and being on my own. Eventually, it got so dark I could only see where my headlamp was pointing, and that's when I figured I needed to stop and get my camp set up. Only using the headlamp as my light source and trying to move fast, I ended up in a less than ideal spot. There was some burnt pieces of wood and the remains of a fire circle, so it looked like people had been there before, but definitely not recently. 
My first priority was to get a fire going. I scanned the area around me and was able to find some dry wood and I got the fire going. I got my tarp set up and cracked open a can of chili mac I had brought for myself and was very much looking forward to eating. I was feeling good. My camp was set up and my food was on the fire. The feeling of uneasiness from the hike in had almost gone away, but it was still there. Side effect of camping alone in remote areas. To fully understand what happened, I have to explain how my camp was set up. The site I had picked was a small clearing surrounded by large pine trees with the trail about 30 feet to my left. There was a small circle of light from my fire and everything past it was pitch black. I was sitting on the ground near my fire, eating my dinner, when a small rock about the size of a marble was thrown into my camp. I looked at the tiny rock in shock, as I was positive I was the only person on the trail that night. I immediately turned my light and faced it toward the area where I had seen the rock come from. Due to the density of the pines and brush, I could only see about 10 feet. I spent the next 15 minutes in disbelief as I scanned the tree line that surrounded me, searching for what or whoever had thrown the rock, not daring to stray too far from my fire. After sitting back down and spending the rest of my time on high alert, I was able to convince myself that I had somehow kicked the rock or it had fallen from a tree. That night, I awoke to the sound of rustling leaves, barely audible but still there. I was still in a sleepy daze as I listened. The rustling of leaves got harder to hear and I assumed they were moving away from me. I went to grab my handheld flashlight that I had left next to me when I had fallen asleep, but I soon came to realize that it was no longer there. I stood up in my sleeping bag and ducked out of the tarp and looked around. I was able to see a light off in the woods. It couldn't have been more than 15 feet away. It was my flashlight laying on the ground on a pile of leaves. The flashlight that I had left sitting right next to me when I had fallen asleep a few hours ago was now 15 feet away from me, past the tree line. I quickly slipped my boots, clutched my knife in the other hand, and keeping my head on a swivel, I weighed my options. Stay here and wait out the night, or attempt the three mile hike back to the car in the dark. I figured that whatever, or whoever was out there with me, was definitely going to have a better advantage if I was on the trail without a light. I decided to stay at the camp and waited out the night there. Eventually, it came back. I could hear it walking through the woods. It was far off, but I could hear it. It sounded like someone was leisurely walking by, like they were on a stroll without a care in the world. Sometimes it would walk far away, and I would lose the sound of its steps, but then it would return, still faint as ever. This went on for about three or four hours until the steps got closer and closer. Now they were about seven feet from me. At this point the fire had become very small as I had run out of wood in my pile. The footsteps stopped and everything went totally silent. I sat there still for two hours clutching my knife in my hand and praying I wouldn't hear anything else. I stayed like that until the sun cast enough light that I could see that I was alone in my campsite. I packed my things and speed walked the three miles down the trail I had taken. I arrived at the empty dirt road where my car was parked. I nearly sprinted to my Subaru as I unlocked it, jumped in and drove, not stopping until I had put at least 20 miles between me and that place. I ended up in a gas station in Apache Junction to buy some Red Bull, but mostly just to see and or talk to another person. As I exited the store, I was able to read something that was written in the dust on the back window of my car. It said, Sleep well. This story happened during my teenage years, at 15 or 16 years old. I lived in a small town of 2,000 people mainly surrounded by boreal forest in a region of Quebec, Canada. This place was great, as we often saw deer, and it was usually a quiet and safe place. To give a bit of context, my house was located at the end of a dead-end street, 
and the only light source at night was my house's. There was a single street light at the end of the road, but it only lit up part of the street and the forest behind it. We were a dog family. I only had small dogs when I lived there. Every day we needed to let them out to pee, as all dogs do, but at night they were almost impossible to see because of the darkness. Our terrain was kind of big, and the light sources were weak. I was a gamer at the time, and I was often up late. So I was the one who needed to take the dog out to pee at 2 a.m. because it stayed with me while I was playing. One night, I opened the door and waited for my dog to do his thing. While trying to look at it, I was only able to see the reflection of the light in its eyes when it looked at me. I started to look around because there was sometimes deer sleeping in the woods under the street light or wild turkeys roaming around when a little dark spot caught my attention. It looked like a human head coming out of the bushes, but I wasn't able to see it because it was a bit in the dark. I don't want my dog to run after whatever it was. It had a tendency to run after wild animals, so I called to it. It didn't listen to me, but the thing in the bushes started to crawl towards the street, slowly. It looked like a human, with thin limbs and a normal body and a slightly long neck. I started to freak out a bit and shook the treats cup so my dog would hurry. It came inside running and I shut the door as fast as I could. I turned off the lights in my house so I could have a view of what was outside. The strange animal crawled fast, almost running like a dog with every limb broken as an improvised crawling movement. The animal passed under the light where I saw it had no fur, like a shaved animal. It was disgusting. I was afraid and standing in the dark. The animal ran towards the light and continued on the street, where I wasn't able to see it because the houses in my neighborhood were surrounded by trees. I locked the door and went to sleep with my dog. I talked to nobody about it. A couple months later, I went to bed kinda early, 11pm, and went to watch some videos on my phone. They were gaming videos and I had earphones on. A sound on the video was recurring and I thought it was annoying, like a distant weird scream. After a couple minutes, the video finished and I went to see another, but during the loading, the sound occurred. I took my earphones off and waited for the sound. I heard it and immediately had tears in my eyes. It was coming from my window. My room was at the second floor, so I looked down in the forest to see if there was some movement. The only light near the forest entrance was the moonlight and an underwater light in our pool that emitted a small halo around it. I wasn't able to see anything, but the sound occurred again. It was like a mix between a distorted scream and a pig having its throat slit or a strong pain whining from a dog. I looked down and saw an animal that passed so fast that it was hard to really see but I barely saw a human-sized animal with limbs crawling like a spider. It wasn't running after anything, but the sound occurred another time. It was the most horrible thing I ever heard. I closed my window to choke a bit by the sound of it. I heard it again three other times, and it stopped after that. I talked to my dad about the sound, and he told me it was probably a deer being attacked by a wild animal. I was so scared of it, I barely walked in the woods at night the three following years, before moving in a city to go out of university. Even to this day, I never heard of an animal like that, and it made me really doubt my mental health at the time, because I had PTSD from a dog attack mid-middle school, and I sometimes had light hallucinations when I gamed for too long, like a black shadow that disappears immediately, or things like that. There were barely any reports of wolves, coyotes, or bears in my area. And believe me, I made a lot of discoveries exploring the forest in this town. I am posting this because I am truly out of options. My employers refuse to take my reports and have even threatened termination of my contract if I bring these events back to the table again. The local authorities are dismissive, or even worse, accuse me of substance abuse and mental instability. I can't even tell my own family, 
lest they draw the same conclusions. I wouldn't want to drag them into this anyway. Hopefully some of you can help me, or at least help me understand what's going on. I have worked as a forester in the Appalachia for a logging company that will go unnamed for nearly a decade now. In that time, I have come to love my job, the woods, and the freedom that accompanies both. But things have started to change with my most recent assignment. The woods used to feel so safe, so clean. Now I can't stop my hands from shaking when I stand beneath the green canopy. So we're all on the same page. I'll walk you through the fieldwork of my profession. First, the company assigns me to a tract of land they have recently acquired. I do some less exciting prep work in the office, satellite imaging, GIS, property analysis, etc. And then I head out into the field. Generally, the sites are pretty far from the office, requiring multiple hour drives and overnight camping. I bring along some simple gear, tape measures, manual colonometer and altimeter, bright neon orange marking spray paint, and my GPS transmitter and marker. All in all, a bunch of technical nonsense that lets me determine the value of trees, which should be logged, and which should be left behind to ensure no permanent damage is done to the forest. Simple enough. It was early morning on September 21st, 2019, when my office desktop pinged that I had an incoming email. Seeing that it was an assignment from corporate, I opened it up and nearly let out a cheer in my cubicle. The tract that I had been assigned was a huge patch of old growth forest, located near the Mongahela National Forest in West Virginia. For those of you who don't know, an old growth forest is a wooded area that has not been disturbed for hundreds of years allowed to grow and develop in its natural state without intervention by farming, construction, or logging. Many old growth forests haven't been touched since the settlers arrived, and some even before then. In any case, this was cause for celebration. Old growth is increasingly rare and amazingly beautiful, and I was the one assigned to explore it. Of course, this was bittersweet, seeing as I would be the last to see it in its undespoiled state before I gave the loggers the go-ahead. I spent the morning in my office packing my things and loading them into the tiny white Ford Ranger, lovingly nicknamed Piper, that the company had provided to me when I started working for them. She was a rugged little thing, having carried me through the mountains for almost a decade without protest. Of course, she wasn't without her quirks, crank-operated windows, a rattling tailgate, and an AC that hadn't functioned since 2011. But I love that tiny little truck. Piper and I set out around noon, making good time on the four-hour drive through the rugged depths of West Virginia. We arrived at the old trailhead that would deliver me to my tract late into the afternoon. As I strapped my heavy backpack on and locked Piper up for her stay at the edge of the woods, I breathed deeply, taking in the heavy scent of the forest earth and the sound of the wind and birdsong through the treetops. Giving my truck a pat on the hood, I turned and made my way off the country road and onto the narrow dirt track that wound into the woods. The hike to the old growth stand of trees took about an hour of brisk trekking, the path becoming more and more overgrown as I progressed. It was obvious this trail hadn't been consistently used for years, probably decades. Nearly to my destination, I happened across what should have been the first sign that something was not right. An ancient sycamore tree stood in the center of the path. Had it been any other species, I would have sidestepped and kept plugging ahead. But sycamores had always been my favorite trees, so I looked upwards to admire the old beauty. About 12 feet off the ground, twisted and woven through the tangle of white-barked branches, was a decomposing skeleton of a deer. Scraps of fur and mummified tendons the only things holding it together as it dangled from the tree. I gasped and stepped back from the initial shock, the staring skeletal visage of the old deer being the last thing I expected to see. My first thought was a mountain lion or a similar predator had hauled the animal up there to feast upon. Carnivores like that were pretty rare in the area, 
but I had guessed it wasn't entirely out of the question. But my confusion spiked, and the rumblings of dread gestated in my gut when I looked a bit closer. It was difficult to tell due to the distance from the forest floor and the amount of time the deer had been up there. But as I squinted, I started to notice something haunting. The decrepit animal remains were not simply jumbled up in the tree branches. They were lashed into place by scraps of rope and cloth. Someone had hauled the deer 12 feet up in the sycamore tree and tied its limbs and joints so it would stay suspended up there. Directly beneath the nearly completely rotted animal, barely visible due to age, was carved a simple O, presumably put onto the bark by whoever took the time to create this macabre installation. I was understandably shocked and confused by this discovery, but the apparent age of the carving and carcass eased my worries a little. Whoever had done this obviously done their work months ago. I resolved that until I happen across fresher work, I was unlikely to run into anyone else out here in the woods. Having reassured myself for the moment and excited to lay eyes on the rare old growth, I carried on down the trail towards my destination. I reached the edge of my assigned stand around 6.30 at night. The old, ill-maintained trail terminating in a small clearing on the border of the forest I hiked through, and the secluded acres of old growth that waited beyond. I gazed awestruck at what waited for me. Ancient tree trunks that soared stories high, capped with dense foliage that cast the groves beneath the placid twilight. One of the defining features of old growth is the lack of understory. Smaller plants robbed of the sunlight by the canopy above. This means that you can see much further than you could in a different forest, where brush and vines might block your view. In the old growth ahead of me, I could see deep into the canopy shaded woods, darkness enveloping the trees that grew and twisted in gnarled shapes. Ancient beings shaped by countless years into warped and beautiful lines. I was nearly overtaken by the sight, a view so few people are able to look upon in this modern age. Even though I was nearly shaking with excitement to explore the acre's large stand of forest ahead of me, I knew that daylight would not last much longer. I would have to push off starting my work until the next day, working quickly to pitch my tent and create a small stone ring to act as a fire pit, before nightfall overtook my new campsite. The first night on the edge of the old growth forest was so quiet. As I lay tightly wrapped in my sleeping bag, staring up through the vent net in the roof of my tent toward the stars above, I heard almost none of the sounds one might expect from camping deep in the woods. No night birds called, no insects buzzed. The only sounds were the rushing of the wind through the leaves, and once a mournful sound of an owl hooting somewhere within the ancient grove beyond the camp. I sat there awake in eerie silence for nearly the entire night, partially perturbed by the quiet but mostly entranced by the beauty of the starlit sky filled with excitement for the day to come. I eventually drifted off to sleep around 2 a.m. At 5.30 in the morning, I was awoken by the electronic chirping of my watch alarm, signaling the start of my day. Groggily sitting up, I immediately regretted not forcing myself to sleep earlier yanking the zipper of my tent flap and exposing myself to the chill morning air. I rose to a stoop and began to exit my tent. As my head left the tent, I stopped, frozen and staring. I was staring down the barrel of a pump-action shotgun, clutched in the hands of a middle-aged bearded man. He wore old flannel and denim, a stained old baseball cap over the mop of gray hair. His face was cracked and split by intricate wrinkles the telltale aging endured by a man who had spent his life outdoors. His gray eyes squinted as he met my shocked gaze, lowering the gun. Well, crap. I'm sorry, son. I didn't expect anybody. What do you mean you didn't expect anybody? I asked, anger boiling to the surface as the shock of surprise ebbed away. You walked into a campsite at five in the morning. Why wouldn't there be anybody here? His gnarled face didn't change from its stony demeanor. Look, boy, I said I was sorry. No harm, no foul, right? He shrugged nonchalantly, irritatingly dismissive of the fact that he had a loaded gun pointed between my eyes mere moments ago. 
He slung the weapon over his shoulder and extended a hand to help me out of my tent. Most tents you find up here are empty. It took a moment for what he had said to sink in. What do you mean? Like people come up here and dump their trashed old equipment? Disappointment began to brew as the thought of the old growth filled with trash entered my mind. Nah, son, nothing like that. Just exactly what I said. The tents you find up here are always empty. The name's Randy. Randy Davidson. This plot belonged to my grandpa, and his grandpa before him. His West Virginia draw was thick and slow as he gestured toward the old growth stand. Before grandpa sold it to National Forest folks, eminent domain and whatnot. I furrowed my brow. Not only had I had the shock of my life less than a minute ago, now I was listening to the family history of some Appalachian backwater dude. My patience grew thin. So is that why you go around poking in other people's stuff, scaring them when they wake up, for old time's sake? Randy squinted again, unimpressed with my impatience. Look, boy, all I'm gonna say is you better watch yourself out here in these woods. Grandpa used to tell stories. Was happy to have the feds take his land off his hands. Just pack up and leave is my advice. And with that, he turned and started walking away in the direction he came from. I stood there in uneasy silence and just watched him go. Was that a warning or a threat? And what could he have possibly meant about empty tents? His message had surprised and confused me as much as his sudden appearance in my camp. The early morning light grew brighter and the mist that clung to the ground burned away as I gathered my things and prepared for my first foyer into the old growth stand. I nearly inhaled my breakfast, excited to start my work. Then, pack filled and secured, I stepped beyond the edge of the grove. The old growth was breathtaking. Ancient trees surrounded me as I walked, dark twisting shapes disappearing into the shadowy canopy high above. No underbrush cluttered the ground, just stoic old boulders and thick sheets of soggy moss. The dense cover of leaves above cast the entire huge stand in the eerie pall of cool shade. The heavy earthy scent of loamy earth and wet woods filled my nose and lungs. Pristine silence filled the forest. I set to work immediately, invigorated by my utterly gorgeous surroundings. The noise I made was the only sound that echoed through the ancient woods around me, joining the quiet wind and leaves above. I identified species, measured trunk diameters, calculated height and slope, judged quality timber from trees best left standing. Dang, I thought to myself. Almost all of these trees were worth thousands of dollars in timber as individuals. This stand of old growth alone would likely net the company over a million dollars after harvest. How had this place not been logged yet? With a metallic rattle and aerosol hiss, I marked the trees that would be best harvested with my flagging paint. With the forest floor so clear of undergrowth, the bright orange X's I sprayed on the tree trunks could be seen in the distance in every direction looming out of the darkness in their obviously unnatural neon hue. It felt strange to be painting this place, so long left beyond the reach of humanity. It was after 4pm when I was finishing up the last sections of the stand I decided to work on today. There was a small, low valley near the center of the growth, edged by mossy boulders and muddy slopes. I had nearly finished marking the chosen trees in the valley when I came across something hauntingly strange. As I rounded the massive trunk of an old beautiful red oak, I saw it, sitting in the middle of a tiny clearing, shaded by dark leaves above, was the rusted hulk of an old RV. The paint was chipped and peeled away, almost to the point of non-existence, though there was still enough to make out the classic script of Winnebago. The tires were flat, sacks of rubber draped over rusted hubcaps. Moss grew over the windows of the abandoned vehicle. At least the glass hadn't been shattered and dropped away. The side door hung open on failing hinges, revealing nothing but inky darkness inside. I slowly approached the derelict, wet moss and leaves squelching under my boots. How did this thing get down here? There's no way it could have driven down these slopes of the valley. And there weren't any signs that it had fallen or crashed down there. 
besides the ravages of time. The old RV seemed undamaged. I stepped within a few feet of the Winnebago's open door. I fumbled through my backpack and produced my flashlight, noticing that the vehicle was ringed by a thick layer of heavy gray mud. Spurred by curiosity, I clicked my flashlight on and stepped on board the ruined RV through the broken door. As I did so, the eerie vehicle let out a wretched moan as a twisted spring shifted for the first time in what likely had been decades. I threw a glance back over my shoulder into the forest, suddenly feeling watched. All I noticed through the forest gloom were the neon orange X's I spray painted on the trees, pointed at haphazard angles and particularly hidden by gnarled trunks. The interior of the RV was dark as night, even with the gloomy daylight filtering through the small sections of broken windows. The stark white beam of my flashlight cut through the darkness. A circle of vision, too small for comfort. Something felt off the moment I was inside. The cabin of the vehicle was almost empty. Driver and passenger seats devoured down to metal frames by generations of vermin. Crusty lichen encased the steering column. The cup holders held two metal thermoses. The words, number one dad and number one mom, just barely visible through the years of sylvan filth that had accumulated upon them. I turned my face to the main living space of the old wreck. Silence thick on the air, and only cut through by the creaks of the moldering floor beneath me. The built-in couch here had also suffered the same fate as the cabin seats, devoured by rats and insects searching for a nest. Cupboards hung open near the low ceiling, cardboard boxes of food within reduced to pulp and slurry by years of exposure. I shone my needle of light across the room, noticing the narrow door at the rear. It hung barely ajar, a crack of darkness presumably leading to the RV's bedroom. As I stepped closer, a stench of mildew and wet dirt grew almost overpowering. With a groan of rusty hinges, I pushed the door open. My body ran cold as my flashlight beam settled on what waited beyond the doorway. Shocked, my breaths came quick and shallow as I took in the sight. The room held a bed, mattress and blankets untouched by foraging pests, but stained a deep black brown by mold and who knows what else. Upon the bed was a heap of clothing, gathered from a suitcase haphazardly left to rot on the floor around the bed. The clothes were stained the same shade as the foul mattress. I could make out at least four distinct sizes of clothing in the pile. Two adults and two children. The stink of rotting vegetation was unimaginable. My hands shook, bobbing my light as they did so. As I gazed at the top of the pile, atop the wet heap of moldy old clothing was a dripping carcass of a deer, broken and twisted at unnatural angles to allow the decaying thing to be propped up in a pose like a man sitting cross-legged. Its head was bowed towards me, what was left of the meat blackened by rot. Its eyes had long since gone, leaving empty black sockets to stare into the dark. The cluster of mossy and scattered bones by the headboard revealed that this was merely the most recent animal left there, the next in a long line of deer propped up in this mess. Despite the dribbling animal wreckage before me, there was no smell of rotting, just the only wretched and overpowering odor of composting vegetation and decomposing fungus. Acrid vomit filled my sinuses and I bolted to the door behind me as I stuck my head and shoulders outside and prepared to retch. My eyes laid upon fresh horror. The bright orange of my marking paint sprayed at haphazard and dissonant angles as I had wandered the valley, all faced towards me in uniform stares. Every X I had painted down there looked towards me, neon color cutting through the forest gloom like electric eyes. The remainder of the food left my stomach, replaced by ice water as I lurched forward and vomited messily upon the mossy ground. Leaning from inside the RV, body shaking with confusion and terror, I wiped the tears from my eyes. The smell of rotting wood still clogged my nostrils. I stared at the splatter of fresh vomit below me attempting to comprehend what I was looking at. The steamy bile was collecting in a footprint of the sticky gray mud. My shaky breath rattled in my lungs as I stared. It was unmistakable. Fresh tracks in the mud that surrounded the RV. 
a complete circle that stalked around the vehicle. They were deep, pressed into the muck by something big and heavy. The tracks took on a shape of a half-human foot, the long toes and forefoot, evident like the tracks of someone walking barefoot and tiptoeing. What? Even the partial footprints were bigger than the tracks I had left. How would something so large move so quietly around the RV? I hadn't heard a thing from inside. I rose to trembling feet and took a cautious step outside. The old growth was utterly silent beyond my nervous panting. The bright orange X's still stared in my direction, not one where I had originally placed it. Crap, I thought to myself. I stood, scanning the empty forest floor and listening for any sounds to pierce the quiet. Seconds passed, feeling like an eternity, and then I bolted. Fear pounded in my ears as I sprinted through the forest, never once slowing as I made for camp. The feeling of a cold, calculating look from unseen eyes never left my back as I ran. I skidded into my tiny camp on the edge of the stand as the sun began to dim in the darkening sky, nearly collapsing with exhaustion as the daylight that filtered through the trees above began to decay. As I panted and gasped with exertion, I surveyed my surroundings. My tent and fire ring appearing untouched since I left this morning. As dusk settled over the forest, my surroundings began to darken. It wouldn't be long until they were black as the old growth at my back. There was no way I could leave tonight. Even if I wasn't petrified to be out in the dark, there wasn't any chance I could find my way back to Piper through the dark and unfamiliar woods. My mind raced as daylight failed around me. Do I set a fire and hope light and flames keeps whatever is out there at bay? Or do I sit in the darkness and pray I stay hidden in the shadowy and silent camp? There was no good options. I tensed up as I fought panic from setting in. Eventually, the primal instincts of my cave-dwelling ancestors kicked in. Fire was the one tool that always served our kind against darkness and the things that lurked within it. I piled all of my firewood into the ring. I wouldn't need it for another night. And as the night fell, the glowing light of my bonfire lit the forest around me, faltering at the edge of the old growth, my camp surrounded in firelight. I climbed inside my tent and sealed the zipper shut. I sat silently inside the thin nylon shell for hours, listening as the wind made the only sound beyond the crackling of the fire which glowed through the walls of the tent. My hands shook and my spine prickled with nerves. My teeth chattered despite the humid heat that clung to me, sweat dripping from my brow. I moved slowly to check my watch. 3.30 a.m., less than two hours until I could flee this place. I jolted as a sudden snap shattered the silence. The sharp cracking noise emanated not 20 feet from my tent and followed by staccato rustling before sudden silence. My eyes were wide. The quiet, nearly imperceptible rustling came again. Whatever was outside was still there. I slowly grasped the zipper and pulled it with my left hand, while fumbling about with my right hand until it came to rest upon my pocket knife. It was a feeble little thing, but as a gift from my dad, it has always found its way into my pack. With my little blade clutched tight, I opened the door of my tent, slowly to keep the zipper quiet. I crept out into the night, the chilled air shockingly cold as it connected with my overheated and clammy skin. The bonfire still burned, though it had run low as the night dragged on. Silently surveying the camp before me, I searched for the source of the hushed sound. Slowly my eyes was drawn upwards toward the boughs of the trees. Two eyes reflected in the firelight staring back at me. Shock gripped my heart and it took all of my willpower not to exclaim with fear and surprise. The eyes went to the side, as if judging me. With more quiet rustles, the owl shifted on its branch, close enough to the firelight to reveal its identity. Relief flooded my body as I let out a quiet sigh. Then, true terror took over me as I noticed a huge shape in my peripheral vision. I slowly turned my head, tears welling up in my eyes. It sat waiting on its hunches, barely six feet away from me, dimly lit by the embers of the slowly dying fire. At first, I thought it was a huge man, a giant living in the woods. 
but this thing was no human. Never could have been. It sat nearly curled in a fetal ball, long arms clasped to scrawny legs, and shoulders hunched. Its humanoid form was covered in greasy, pale skin stretched, taut over knobby bones and joints. The thing's elongated arms and legs were triple-jointed, digital grade like the hind legs of a malnourished hairless goat. Its arms ended in hands, each bearing six long, twitching fingers, tipped with ragged and blackened nails. Its legs terminated in feet that may have been human, if they were not twisted and deformed, to allow the thing to walk its mud and filth-caked toes. It carried an unbearable stench of fungus and compost, but most horrible of all was its face. Atop its neck rested its gaunt head, oily and pale skin reflecting the guttering flames in the fire pit. Its nose and chin were hideously long and crooked, not unlike the jagged and pointed figures stereotypical of ancient witches. Its mouth was wide, pulled back to reveal black gums and long, blunt teeth that looked as if they had been taken from a human jaw and stretched cartoonishly to fit. Though it had no eyes, it stared intently at the owl in the tree. The twisted and hulking creature crouched beside me and slowly turned its head to face me. Barely visible, white orbs rolled and twitched in sunken eye sockets. The thing stared silently at me before raising a single finger to its drooling teeth. It let out a quiet, gurgling breath. Shh. Panic set my body ablaze. I scrambled to my feet, dropping my tiny pocket knife in the mud. The owl let out a shrieking protest as it took fight, spooked by the sudden movement. As I stumbled backwards, starting my sprint into the pitch black forest, the thing rose to its feet on its tri-jointed legs. The thing had to have been at least seven feet tall, but moved without making a sound. As I turned, it let out a hideous, gasping screech, a sound laden with ancient hate. I didn't look back, dashing through the underbrush, away from the old growth and leaving the empty tent to join the others Randy had found. I don't know if it followed me. It was so big, but it moved so silently. As I ran, I didn't see it, didn't hear it, but the feeling of its look never left me. I ran blindly in the dark, whipping branches and bramble thorns at my face and hands. Sweat drenched me, pooling in my hiking boots. I didn't know how long I ran. At some point, I must have collapsed with exhaustion, blacking out in the depths of the forest. I woke up in the glaring shine of daylight, filtering down onto my face through the trees. My face and hands were caked with dirt. Two of my fingers were at least dislocated. Rising on shaky legs, I began my blind trek into the unfamiliar woods around me, hopelessly lost. I walked for hours, likely wandering in circles. My face and hands ached with a dull, pulsing pain. My skin itched and burned underneath. Finally, I stumbled upon the forest trail, old and ill-maintained. I couldn't believe my luck. I had resigned myself to being lost, being alone and hunted deep in the unsettled Appalachia. Tears welled up as I hurriedly limped down the path, and I nearly shouted with elation when Piper came into view. Fumbling my keys, I managed to unlock her and climb inside, slamming and locking the door behind me. As I fired the ignition and the truck started up, the burning on my torso intensified an awful, itching sensation. Grimacing, I quickly set to see what the cause of my discomfort was. As I did so, a subtle stench of old vegetation began wafting into my truck. I felt cold eyes staring from the fringes of the woods. I pulled my jacket open, and the source of the itch, across my torso, spray-painted there with marker paint, was a bright orange X. The day I had been dreading finally came. After months of denied reports, quiet but heated arguments behind my boss's closed door, and the most intense procrastination ever known to man, the company sent me back to the old growth. You have to believe me, I fought it. But in the end, my protests were less than useless. I would have quit this job if I could, but I have bills to pay, fees to keep my parents cared for at their old age. There was nowhere to hide. 
The neon orange marker paint that I had discovered sprayed onto the Forester's X upon my torso had washed away easily enough, but it had left behind an angry red rash of scaly skin. The doctor told me that it was likely an allergic reaction to a chemical propellant in the aerosol, or a component of the paint itself. The itching rash had faded over time, but never fully disappeared. The faintest ghost of the mark that haunted me, just barely visible to those who cared to look close enough. I had completed one or two assignments since the experience I previously recounted for you all. Working in Pennsylvania and around DC to mark up and measure tiny stands of trees just outside the bustling suburban corridors. Even in those minuscule groves of adolescent trees and shrubs, the green grow of the canopy sent shivers down my spine. I was a wreck in nearly every sense of the word, and I don't think anyone who believed me could blame me. The problem was that no one actually did believe me, not truly. The email from the company heads came on March 2nd, 2020. When I saw it in my inbox, I sat silently staring in my cubicle for agonizing minutes before finally resigning myself to cold acceptance. I scanned the details with defeat. Return to parcel. Mono Nahela National Forest. Work imperative. Multi-million dollar stake. Depart immediately. The rest of that morning is just a foggy blur, dragging myself through duties in preparation to return to the place where I had encountered something I could not explain. Something I could not forget. It must have been just before noon when Piper and I were roaring down the interstate towards the dreaded grove. Acres of black woods and hidden things. I shouldn't have gone. I have no recollection of the four hour drive into the depths of West Virginia. The next thing I knew, I was standing next to my truck, engine clicking and popping as it cooled and settled, with my heavy pack slung over my shoulders. Ahead of me loomed a narrow trailhead that led to a forest the world had forgotten. With a shuddering breath, I steeled myself and stepped into the woods. The sensation was so strange. My mind was caught in a vicious wrestling match between feelings of terror and the comfort of coming home. I absent-mindlessly pawned at the faded mark under my jacket as I tramped along the winding and undergrown path. Thoughts churned and changed with my aching mind. The things I had seen here, half remembered and half unforgettable. The splendor of the unspoiled forest around me, grinning, teeth, the endless awe of the old growth. I walked in a daze like man towards the gallows, or perhaps towards a holy relinquiry. By the time I walked around the old sycamore tree, just a few scant bones left lashing in its branches, I had regained my senses. The sights and sounds of the woods returned to me as I made it towards the old campsite. I wiped away the watery stuff running from my nose. It was just cold out here. Only the first buds of the year starting to appear on the branches of the trees. This was about the time I began cursing to myself for coming back out here. But it was far too late now. Suddenly, I stepped out into the tiny clearing in which I had once made camp. On the far end of the break in the woods waited the boundary of old growth, looming ancient trees cast in a shade of dark, old leaves that still clung to their storing branches in stark refusal to let the sunlight desecrate the floor of the grove. Even in the latest days of winter and the earliest days of spring, shadow ruled the old growth waiting ahead. As I stared, a chill wind whispered from between the tree trunks stinging my face and whipping through the air. A grim thought crawled through my mind. Yeah, hello to you too. Pulling my gaze from the dark boundary ahead of me, I surveyed the small clearing. The ground was sodden and muddy with snow melt. The detris of water was fading away with the season. The shredded remnants of my old tent stood in half-hearted defiance of gravity. Poles bent and broken in angles, better suited to modern art. Slowly pulling open the door flap of the mostly collapsed tent, I saw that all of the original contents were missing. My sleeping bag and backpack I had carried out here previously, nowhere to be seen. I just let the tent flap fall back. There was no salvaging the nylon heap. Just as Randy, 
the local who had accosted me the last time I was here, had said, The tents you find here are always empty. I turn around to check the fire pit, less than a dozen feet behind me. The stones were still there, but not as I had left them. The rounded forest stones, now covered in crawling moss and flaking lichen. They were stacked in a perfect tower that came up to stomach height. One on top of the other, they were balanced immaculately. The slightest breeze should have been enough to upset the delicate cairn. But the stones did not fall. Atop of the tower of stones, untouched by vegetation, age, or weather, was my pocket knife, dropped in the shock of my previous encounter here. With a spiteful sniff, I snatched the knife and gave the stones a small kick, letting the tower crumble to a pile. I made camp in the clearing over the next hour or so, pitching my new tent and reconstructing the fire ring. I unfurled a large ball of twine I had brought with me, attached aluminum cans to it as I laid a trapwire perimeter around my little oasis. Setting an alarm like this would do little to help me, should anything go wrong during my stay here but it eased my worry just the same. Just as night fell, I sat by my fire, listening to the silence of force that I knew all too well. I awoke in my tent in the early morning rays of the sunlight to the buzzing sound of my watch, letting me know it was time to work. I went through my morning routine, had my breakfast, threw my backpack on, stepped over my trap wire, and marched as stoically as I could to muster across the clearing towards the waiting old growth. As I quietly stepped across the mossy floor of the darkened grove, I noticed one thing. My work was gone. All of the bright orange X's I had marked upon the trees that were meant to be harvested had disappeared like the mist in the wind. That paint was designed to last as long as the logging projects may drag on, sometimes years and I had sprayed it here merely six months ago, and now it was all gone. The bark of the trees, barren of paint and gnarled and blackened by hundreds of years, mocked me. Gritting my teeth, I began to work. I toiled for hours that day in the chilly March weather, the ancient forest around me silent beyond the sounds of my work, measuring, mapping, marking. I went through my tasks quickly and robotically, never once shaking the undeniable sensation of cold eyes on my back. Maybe my fear made me more perceptive, or maybe the forest and what waited within, it simply chose to show me more than it ever had before. Whatever the case, I saw things. Rare sights that punctuated the hours within the stand, animal bones lashed to and dangling from branches that towered over the muddy ground, a bright yellow hunter's cap soaked with water and stuffed into a gap between boulders, the rusted lower frame and wheels of an old-fashioned baby carriage, a tangled pile of twine and aluminum cans, new and untouched by age or weather. There was less than an hour of daylight left as I finished my first day of work. I rounded the thick trunk of a massive honey locust. Stinging odor of the marker paint was still wafting from the fresh X I had marked there. Beyond the old tree was a steep forest pothole, perhaps a sinkhole that had collapsed thousands of years ago. It had dropped merely five feet down, and maybe ten feet across. Drawn by some human curiosity, I peered over the edge. The sides of the shallow pit were choked thick with roots and sheets of moss, creating a coiled mass of wet vegetation that stacked downwards, dangling into the murky foot and half rainwater and snowmelt that collected at the bottom of the wide hole. The smell of stagnant water and something far worse rose up to meet my nose, causing me to recoil at the stench. A shiver ran down my spine as I looked upon what floated in the pit below. Fur matted and oozing mud and rotting mold clung to bloated meat. The extremities revealed the darkened and spongy remnants, soaked through with the stinking and stagnant water that filled the pool. The horrid thing had at one point been a large dog, perhaps a German shepherd, judging by the patches of fur. Strapped across the dog was an old backpack I had left behind the first time I came to the old growth. The sharp sound of a snapping twig came from behind me, and I whirled to face the noise, sudden shock gripping my racing heart. The man stood there, wrinkled and weather-beaten face below a stained old cap. I recognized Randy Davidson a split second before he spoke. 
Well, I'll be gone, he drawled, recognition sparking in his eyes, as gray as his hair. The remnants of the old rash on my torso twitched dully. It's you again. What are you doing back out? His question was suddenly cut short as a massive pale shape lunged from the growing shadows around us. The hulking white thing moved soundlessly as it took Randy into the muddy ground. He let out a gasp as the air was knocked out of him. With inhuman speed, it whipped around to face me, and my existence ran cold as I laid eyes on its all-too-familiar grin and greasy flesh. The stench of the rotting moss wafted over me. Pale orbs twitched in their membrane-covered sockets as the horror struck in me. A single, triple-jointed arm reaching out and bashing into my torso. The thing hit with the strength of a feral beast. Bolts of pain shooting through my torso. The lightning-fast strike sent me skidding and stumbling backwards. The feeling of weightlessness overtaking me as I tumbled into the pit at my back. I was still attempting to get air in in response to the creature's strike when I hit water. Stinking liquid rushing in. I had landed almost directly onto the dog. I lurched upwards out of the shallow pool, alternatively gasping for air. Adrenaline roared in my ears. I could hear the sounds of struggle above, crashing branches and spattering mud accompanied by Randy's voice of terror. I scabbed at the slick moss and roots around me, attempting to haul myself out the short distance of the sinking pit. Slipping on wet vegetation and collapsing mud, I managed to drag my shoulders above the edge of the sinkhole. I saw Randy struggling against the pale thing that stalked the old growth, pinned to the ground with its hooked nose mere inches from his face. I watched in horror as the thing craned its neck downwards with an almost serpentine sway, joints creaking as it did so. It parted its long, blunted teeth. His screams were muffled as the thing leaned in. They held their struggling as I hauled myself out of the pit. Then it craned backwards, turning its face to meet my terrified stare. Randy had a breath, its teeth clenched in a disgusting mockery of a grin. I sat up on all fours at the edge of the pit as it released Randy, spectral grace bellying its monstrous size as it rose to its full, towering height. Joints and tendons creaked within its gaunt self as it took slow and purposeful steps towards my prone form. A deep, cloaking click slowly emanated from the depths of it as it reached towards me with its black fingernails. When all of a sudden I was yanked to my feet and dragged to the side, it was Randy, coughing as he pulled my jacket collar. Come on and run, he gasped, not letting go of me as he began sprinting into the woods that surrounded us. I pumped my legs to keep up, the speed of terror propelling me. We dove through the old growth, ancient trees seeming to twist around us in the growing darkness. Mud clotted our boots and threatened to pull us into the ground with every step we took. I followed Randy, hoping he had a destination, and was not simply running into the woods in a panic. Looking over my shoulder, I could not see the thing following us, but I could hear it somewhere in the gloom as it laughed and called. Noises, like the hellish fusion of a squealing pig and a cackling lunatic. I don't know how long we fled into the darkening night. The sun had disappeared completely by the time we stopped. Panting for a breath and nervously eyeing the woods around us, Randy kneeled over with his hands on his knees and waved a finger past me. I turned to check what he was pointing at and saw a dark shape looming out of the darkness. The blocky bulk of a lightless cabin. I helped Randy towards the structure as he fumbled around in his pocket, producing and jangling a heavy laden keyring. He seemed sluggish, as if the run had taken a steep toll on him. We crossed the creaking porch with haste. The cabin was a plain thing of log timbers, beaten and drained by weather and age until they were desiccated and gray. I stared grimly at the wooden door, which bore a crude and obviously recent carving of an X. Randy put an old-fashioned iron key into the lock and pushed the door open, hurrying inside. I followed. Randy fumbled ahead of me in the darkness, rattling objects which I could not see. I heard the telltale sign of laughter followed by a flash of flint. Then, after a few seconds, the flickering glow of a tiny fire set dancing illumination to weakly fill the space around us. The cabin was tiny, one room of maybe 15 feet on each side. A small cast iron stove, 
caked beyond usefulness by thick layers of rust, with an old pile of firewood at its side stood to my right. Directly ahead was a square table on which rest an electric gathering of woodworking tools and dining utensils in a haphazard stacks, as well as the flickering candle that Randy had lit. Two stools waited tucked underneath the table's edge. At the back of the room was a simple bed, sheets stretched across the lumpy mattress, almost entirely eaten by moths and mice. Small glass-painted windows glinted in the candlelight. Everything was drenched in dust and a smell of mildew, obviously untouched for years. Randy lurched past me, slamming the door shut and ramming the lock closed. As he moved close to me, I could smell foul sweat rolling down his pores. Help me lock the shutters, he said. I moved to oblige him, pulling the heavy wooden shutters over the small windows and looping the hook locks closed. He talked quietly as he worked to close the windows on the other side of the cabin. Great Grandpa's hunting cabin. Came out here once or twice when I was a kid with my old man to check on the property after my grandpa sold it off. He paused to expel a hacking cough. Lucky I even remembered where it was. I glanced over my shoulder as I moved to the final window on my side of the room. Randy, what is this thing? Your guess is as good as mine. I ain't never seen anything like it before in my life. I heard him take a shaky breath. My granddad used to say something wasn't right about these woods. Would tell us things. My old man would spin them off for spinning ghost stories. Well, what do we do now? I never should have come back. The hinges creaked as I forced the shutters against the window. Yeah, maybe you shouldn't have. Randy trailed off as he struggled with his own window behind me. Randy? I probed as silence began to grow. As I slowly turned to see the cause of the quiet, a foul sound and stench got to my senses. A wet, rumbling expulsion of gas and a vicious spattering upon the ground, and the burning odor of sickness, sulfur, brought stinging tears to my eyes. What? Randy? Are you kidding me? The angry words stopped as I whirled around to face him. Randy stood facing me, shivering in place. His face, gaunt and pale, streamed with sweat and tears, which ran down and pooled in his deep wrinkles of his skin. Dark circles, the deep purple of an old bruise, had formed under his eyes, which stared blankly ahead. His nose dribbled with spit and mucus. Randy whispered in a quiet, Well, dang. Before going to the ground, sliding down the old timbers to lay against the cabin wall. Fighting back panic, I rushed to his side, he rolled his head weakly to face me. Oh my, Randy, what's happening? I took his sweat-drenched hand in my own. Granddad got sick like this. Came back from the woods one night. Came back like this. Randy let out a slow cough. Nobody ever knew what happened. He didn't even make it through the night. That it had got him. Nobody knew what he was talking about. Help me. As he spoke, the boards of the cabin porch let out a creak. Randy let out a noise. Oh no, please. He stared at me with begging eyes toward me. Please, get me. The X-shaped rash on my torso felt as if it were on fire. Slow taunting scratching rattled along the floor. With his free hand, Randy at my side. His face was a shattered mosaic of pain and strenuous effort drenched in sweat of sickness. With a weak sound, he brought his head up, clutched his pale and shaking fingers with my pocket knife, the one my dad had given me long ago. He pressed and folded the blade into my hand. Please don't let me go like my grandpa did, he softly begged. The door at my back groaned as slow, even pressure was applied. Randy's sorrowful cloudy eyes stared at me. My torso was a stinging matrix of pain. I held my breath as I stared at the little implement in my hand, then back at Randy. There was a sharp pop and a clatter as the lock snapped and fell to the floor behind me. He gasped for a final moment before falling silent, further slumping soundlessly. I kneeled there sobbing as the floorboards behind me creaked with a heavy weight. A click emanated directly from above me. I closed my eyes. A heavy hand came to rest on top of my head. Inhumanly long fingers stroking my face. 
I sat immobile as creaking joints moved above me. More deep chittering. The sound of dragging and a heavy thump. The hand left my head. The sounds and creaking floorboards retreated towards the door and then were replaced by the cracking of something dragging across the forest floor, deeper into the old growth. I sat in the cabin, eyes tightly shut, until weak rays of sunlight warmed my back through the open doorway. I opened my aching eyelids. Randy was gone. He was pulled away, leaving behind a dark trail which disappeared into the woods. I rose to shaking feet. Mindlessly, I wandered the old growth, I trudged, unfeeling and unthinking. I must have stumbled circles around the forest for hours. In the end, I found myself staring at my truck, my fateful old piper, through bleary eyes. On the stark white paint of her hood, smeared, was a huge forester's X. A squealing cackle echoed somewhere in the distance of the woods. Where the lines crossed in the center of the hood rest my pocket knife, clean and folded. The world has all but forgotten the old growth, but I never will. So I've never really told anyone about this, and I don't really know how to properly explain what I saw. So this is my first and best attempt. My name is Zach, and I moved to a northwestern city in Washington state in early 2018 and I didn't really know much about the area. I had recently gotten out of a pretty bad relationship, which actually led to me moving to this new city. Best decision of my life, by the way. I lived with my mom and her roommate for a while until I could get my own place, and everything was going pretty well. I had a nice job, made some good money, and I had little to no rent. Plus, I was making a lot of new friends, one night, about two weeks into my new move, my buddy, let's call him Jay, invites me to go play some pool and have a few drinks. It wasn't too late, maybe 9.30, so I happily accepted the challenge, grabbed my phone, which I had unfortunately forgotten to plug in when I got home from work, searched for my keys, and got in my car. Ten minutes later, after blasting Blink-182 and some screamo music, I pull up to the bar. My buddy is already outside and waiting for me, and I sat in my car for a minute before I went to say what's up. We played pool for a while that night, won a few games, lost a few games, before I felt like going home around 11.50pm. My buddy said he's gonna stay and hang out with some people he knew there, and so I left to go get my car and readied my phone for Google Maps to find my way home, and no power. It had run down while I was at the bar, and I didn't know these streets very well, but I didn't want to face the shame of walking back inside to tell my friend that I didn't know how to get home, so I decided to chance it. I mean, it wasn't even a 15 minute drive. It was pretty close by, right? Wrong. I got lost. About 10 minutes later, I realize I've taken a few too many wrong turns and ended up in this residential area with unfamiliar houses and streets. I kept driving on and on down these streets, trying to find a familiar landmark or familiar street name so I could find my way home. But all I found was more and more of these strange residential houses. But then, this weird fog started rolling in now, fog isn't that uncommon in the Pacific Northwest, and I know that, but this fog felt off. It felt heavy. It was this light gray color with a hint of tan, and it was swirling. It also stayed close to the ground and never really went above the tops of the houses. What really freaked me out was when I swear I kept seeing these small bipedal creatures running along the houses through people's yards following my car. I could never get a close look at them to get perfect detail, but they were about two to three feet tall, gray, oily skin, and had what looked like white hair on their heads. These things were fast too, and there were about six or seven of them. They were just running through this fog and the further I went down these roads with them, the thicker the fog was. 
No matter how slow or fast I was going, they kept following me. Or was I following them? I could have been following them. I mean, they were always at my side and in front of me. I never saw them behind me. Were they leading me somewhere? They were so mesmerizing. I just wanted to keep following them, just to see where they were going. But I knew better than that. Something felt wrong. I had to get out of there. I got that weird, sixth sense feeling of, I shouldn't be here right now, right before something bad happens. All of a sudden, this dark gray and white wolf came running out of the fog right in front of my car. I quickly slammed on my brakes, nearly crashing into one of the parked cars along the street. This wolf just stood there in the middle of the street, looking at me. And I swear we locked eyes for what felt like hours. But then, bam, the wolf bolts down the street, and I instinctively follow. I slam the car in drive, peeling out, and began to follow this wolf down side street after side street. This wolf stayed right in the middle of the street the entire time. It was crazy. I had never seen anything like this in my life. I didn't even think there were wolves in this area this close to the city. It wasn't long before I noticed that the fog had gotten lighter and eventually disappeared. That was when I realized that I'm on the road that I recognize that actually leads me to the direction of my house. With a confused, amazed look on my face, I glance back to where the wolf was at, just to see it dart off into the forest, never to be seen again. I got home safely that night, and to this day, I still have no idea what I experienced that night. My two buddies and I went on a hunting trip for bull elk last November, and were having a great time, to say the least. That, however, would soon change after what we saw on the third day. Now, I'm not one for superstition, and I don't believe in ghosts and all that, but what we saw out there really changed my view about those sort of things. The trip started out normally after we parked our trailers at camp. We got there a day before the hunt officially started so we could settle in and get some scouting done. Only Eric and I had licenses, because Brian didn't draw this year, but he wanted to come along with us anyway. Brian also brought along his German Shepherd named Lucy, which stayed back at camp with a leash that was connected to a metal spike. The spike was so deep in the ground that I wondered if he would be able to get it out. I asked Brian, and he just told me that his dog was so strong that it had to be that deep. I enjoyed playing with Lucy. She was always excited to see me and would greet me by jumping up on her two legs and trying to lick my face. Eric, however, was not amused by her and would constantly yell at her to leave him alone. Anyway, the first two days we saw so many cow elk in the valleys and on the sides of the mountains that I thought for sure we would see some bulls out there, but there were none among them. It wasn't until the third day of the hunt that we saw a bull elk but it was too far away to take a shot at. And even if we were able to hit it, it would take hours trying to pack that thing out. So that evening, we decided to hunker down to some fallen trees and were able to watch the hillside. While we were surveying the area, Brian spotted a coyote about 250 yards walking to a small pond of water. Eric took out his binoculars to take a closer look and he started to describe it saying, that coyote, it ain't right looking. It has a hunch on its back like a bear. And its jaw, oh man, its jaw seems like it's broken. And now it's just drooping there like a fish. Let me see those binoculars, I asked curiously with an outreached hand. Eric handed them to me. I took them and looked at the animal and said, You're right, that thing's jaw is just hanging there. Also, did you happen to notice its hair? It's so long and unevenly dispersed. I then handed the binoculars to Brian, and he looked at the coyote for a second and screamed. Shh, Brian, shut up. We're hunting, Eric whispered harshly. What did you see? I asked as I looked at his shocked facial expression. Brian looked at his feet as he muttered. I, I saw my dog, Lucy, but it wasn't her. 
I don't know what that was. It couldn't have been your dog. When I looked at it, it didn't have a large black spot on its back or your dog's strawberry red sides and underbelly. I said in a plain, yet confused manner, Well, since we ain't gonna see anything out here cause you scream like a baby, I'm gonna go put that coyote out of its misery. A large shot followed, and we saw the animal drop soon after. It was a clean takedown, and Eric was curious about seeing what was wrong with the animal up close. So he started getting ready to hike out. As he got his stuff together, he said, You probably just didn't get a good look at it, Brian. Your dog is fine. Brian stood up and he brushed the dirt off himself and replied, I swear, I saw my dog, but an evil, demented version of it with human eyes. But you guys are probably right. There's no way she could have had the strength to yank the metal spike holding her back at camp. Well, let's go find the truth about this animal, I said somewhat excitedly as I started walking toward the animal. It took us about a half an hour to hike over to it, and we lost sight of the animal's corpse as we passed through some trees. Once we finally got to the spot where the animal had dropped, there was nothing, just a puddle of red. However, the red was blackish and very dense. Eric observed the scene and started to scratch his head as he said, there's no way it could have just gotten back up and walked off. I had an eerie feeling about the whole situation and Brian was still afraid that it might have been his dog. Eric, however, noticed a trail leading to the dark tree line. Without asking, he started to follow it. As he did, Brian and I were both freaked out and just watched Eric as he ran into the forest. He soon went out of sight and Brian and I could not leave him there, so we waited. I passed the time by taking a skinny stick and poking it through the puddle of red. It smelled terrible, so much so that my stomach convulsed and I threw up. You okay? Brian asked as he put his hand on my back. Before I could answer, there was a loud shot that echoed through the trees and we both looked at the direction it came from. Must have found the animal. I said as I spit into the grass. As soon as I said this, we could now see Eric and he was full on sprinting. Run! He screamed as he ran at us. I was able to ask him what happened, but Brian grabbed my arm and yanked me towards where we had parked the truck. Without hesitation, I ran. We soon made it back to the truck. I looked back at Eric, who slowed down for nothing. I soon looked behind him and saw nothing chasing us. So I opened the truck and got in without worry. Eric then climbed in and told me to hit the gas and go. I was so perplexed on what Eric saw out there, and I knew that he hardly ever got scared of anything, so this started to freak me out. I started driving fast back to camp. I don't know man, that was no animal. I followed the trail and it stopped at the base of the tree, and I was wondering how a coyote was able to climb a tree. But when I looked up, I saw this hairy humanoid creature there. It smelled so bad. Eric went on about how scary that thing was and how he was done with this hunting trip and wanted to go home. We soon pulled into camp and mutually decided that we were going home. I started to pack my things, then felt like something was missing. I then thought to myself, Lucy, where's Brian's dog? She usually is always excited to see us back at camp. She can't stop whining and barking to be set free. As soon as I thought this, Brian started screaming and crying. I ran over to where he was, and his dog was gone. However, on further inspection, I noticed what Brian was looking at. Something had pulled out the metal stake in the ground. Brian just could not stop crying, and Eric ran over to see what was wrong and just stood there, jaw dropped and frozen. Skinwalker, Eric said in a low tone of voice as he looked in the distance. He then screamed, It's a skinwalker. I followed his gaze and saw an animal that looked like Lucy, but it had human eyes and a sickly green glaze looking coat of fur. Brian stopped crying and just stood there, eyes locked on the beast. Eric whispered with his voice quivering, We all run to the truck, on the count of three, just leave everything else. Brian and I slowly nodded and agreed to the plan. 
Okay. Three, two, one. Eric whispered sharply and we took off like a pack of gazelles for the truck. We hopped in and as soon as we did, we saw the skinwalker lunge at us and struck the truck on the right door with such a powerful blow that it nearly tipped over the whole truck. It didn't stop me whatsoever and I drove out of there faster than I ever have before. After that, none of us ever went hunting again in that area. We never even went back to claim our camping trailers and supplies. It was too terrifying to think that what happened to Brian's dog could happen to us and that thing would walk around in our skin. Since that experience, I am now a superstitious person. There are places in the Rocky Mountains that are known by word of mouth as forbidden areas. This is not because they are private property or owned by the government, but rather because of what lurks in their mists. Anyone stupid enough to wander into these areas, even unknowingly, will be haunted, cursed, or most likely never heard from again. Many cases of missing people in the wilderness are people who have wandered into these territories and who have never come back. These restricted areas can be found all across the world in diverse places. I heard of some of these stories, and one mountain area in particular caught my eye. The stories about it all varied in their description of the creature that lived in there, but they all described the red eyes and sounded admitted exactly the same. And some older people explained that that was all you could see of the creature in the darkness. However, the main thing that they focused on was the sound that it made. Supposedly, it was like a deep clicking sound. It supposedly sent nerves chilling up and down your spine. I was young, immature at this point in my life, and so after hearing these stories, I was very intrigued because I was always fascinated with the supernatural my entire life. I had binge watched all of the TV shows that involved ghost hunting, so I wanted to do some exploring for myself and act like I was some famous ghost hunter. And so I also took a camera with me into this supposedly forbidden mountain area among other simple hiking supplies. I started in the early morning light on the trail. I was not quite yet into the forbidden area when I saw an old man with an antique looking cane off the side of the trail, sitting on a decaying log. I nodded at him while keeping a steady pace, trying to avoid conversation with the man. But he asked me in an old scratchy voice, Where are you headed, young man? You seem awfully eager to be on your way. I stopped and replied, staring at the man's wrinkled face. Nowhere in particular, just out for a hike, that's all, really. The man sat there staring me down for a while, straightening his back and said, I feel an evil presence stirring within you. Your true intentions are not what you have told me. I stood there, perplexed by what he said. I then thought to myself, what is this man talking about? I have no evil intentions. The man then spoke before I was able to ask him a question, saying, The path you choose is your choice, but I'm warning you that whatever it is that you are pursuing on this trail, I beg of you, may you please rethink it. Look here, man, I have no evil intentions, and there's no darkness inside me. I'm just going for a hike, I replied with a weirded out tone. He who seeks after the forbidden land seeks after darkness, and he who seeks after darkness will surely become it. The man stated firmly as he used his cane to stand on his feet. My insides began to twist because this man actually knew what I was doing up here, but how? I have told no one about this trip, so I asked, Who are you and how do you know where I'm going? Young man. This is not important. Listen to me when I tell you to turn around, for there is only demise where you are headed," the man said as he began to shuffle down the trail. What are you talking about? I asked hesitantly, wondering what the man's background story was. However, he did not reply and continued down the trail. 
I looked down at my watch to see how much time I lost by talking to the man. Dang, was that really 10 minutes? I said to myself as I quickly looked back to where the man was walking and saw that he was gone. He was far too slow to have gotten back to the tree line, but there was no other explanation of where he went so fast. I shrugged it off as some crazy old guy in the forest, trying to keep people from going on his land that he's squatting on. He is probably growing some illegal plants out here and is trying to scare people away from finding it. It reminded me of some Scooby-Doo story plot. I tapped my camera that I had in my bag pocket and thought to myself how fun it would be to expose this man and prove all the people scared by this so-called forbidden land wrong. It would be a pleasure to yank the mask off this old wrinkly man's face. Time continued to pass, and soon I was in the heart of the restricted land that fell between the two mountains and was mainly a rocky valley hidden under large ponderosa pines. The sun began to sink behind one of the mountains, and I prepared my camera to take the video of the man dressed as a monster. I was so eager I could hardly maintain my composure and I even let out shivers of excitement. It was at this time I thought I felt a cold chill tickle my spine, and a feeling of uneasiness came upon me. The wind spun with darkness entwined with its every twist and turn. My heart began to pound with every pump. I quickly looked up from the camera on the rock and gazed around me. I saw nothing out of the ordinary until I saw a dark, glowing red dot hidden behind a tree. It looked bright red, and it reminded me of the description of the monster. I shook off my nervous feelings and got back to business. So I quickly turned the camera on and faced it toward the tree. I last saw the red eye. There was nothing there now. Huh? Where did you go? I whispered to myself as I zoomed in on the tree. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a dash of blurred light, and I turned swiftly and started recording. I now saw two red eyes peering at me from a rock that was about 50 meters away. I once again zoomed in the camera on the rock the creature was on, and there was no red dots on the camera's view, but strangely, I could see them clear as day with my eyes. Come on, pick this up. I silently screamed at the camera while doing all the adjusting I could on it, trying to get it to pick up the eyes. After a few moments, I looked up and the eyes were gone but a faint sound began to echo through the trees. Now I knew for sure that this was no animal, but had to be the creature or the man dressed like one. The sound began to become more clear and less faint. It started to scare me with every clicking type sound that cut through the already quiet breeze. I made sure the camera was recording just in case I was able to pick up the sound. I grabbed a stick that was lying nearby and wielded it the sound grew louder with every aching moment, and my heart rate grew as it did. Then, straight ahead of me, the figure with its red eyes with black pupils was crawling towards me. It was a humanoid figure with patches of fur covering parts of its body, but the rest was a sickly pale skin with splotches. My stomach shot up and I was frozen in fear. I knew for sure that there was no crazy man dressed up as a monster by how it moved so inhumanly. As I stood there, the thing's clicking sounds grew louder and more aggressive and slowly crawled toward me. The only thing that I could think of was run. So I threw the stick at the beast and sprinted back into the trail, leaving all my gear but the headlamp I had on. At this point, the sun had gone down and no remnants of it remained. I just ran, not looking back for any reason. A loose rock rolled out from under my foot, which sent me barreling down the side of the rocky hill. My sleeveless legs and arms were all cut up now. Behind me, I heard rocks being knocked down and branches snapping, and that awful sound it makes grew louder. I thought about getting up and running, but my ankle ached too much, so I swiftly looked around for any cover but the only thing I could find that was close enough was a bush with dried up leaves. I had no choice, so I curled up inside of it and turned off my headlamp. My heart began to calm down as I heard the creature become quiet. However, the thing's deformed human face with holes for ears and a mouth large enough to swallow a whole animal caught my gaze. 
Its eyes glowed in the dark, and I felt sick to my stomach looking at it. So I closed my eyes and prayed it wouldn't find me. After a few minutes of silence, I chose to open them, and the humanoid creature was there, just staring at me. I met its eyes, and as I did, I felt dread. All my nightmares popped into my head at once. The only thing I could do was scream. It then lunged at me, and my world went dark. The sun was shining bright in the clear blue sky. I slowly opened my eyes and remembered what had happened, and I jumped to my feet. I looked around me and thought I had gone to heaven. There were beautiful trees, soft looking grass, and a cabin with smoke coming out of it. I headed toward it and knocked on the door. The old man answered with a smile on his old wrinkly face. So, how'd you sleep? You've been out there for two days now. The man asked while brushing his hair on his chin. I replied in a confused tone and then asked, What happened to that creature? Well, I knew you'd be stupid enough to not listen to me, so I followed you to make sure you'd make it out safe. Well, at least most of you would make it out safe. What do you mean by most of me? I asked hesitantly. The man's smile went away as he grabbed his cane and tapped my right leg. I could see his cane hit my leg, but I felt nothing. The old man cleared his throat and said, Your leg is gone, if you haven't noticed. It's the price you had to pay for going into that land. Oh, and you're one of the lucky ones, young man. Many people go missing in these parts and are never heard from again. I stood there shocked as I rolled up my pants to see a wooden leg up to my knee. I was amazed that I haven't noticed until now. I then asked as I saw that he had all of his limbs. How do you go on that land and not get attacked? The same way I was able to get to you. That thing hates light, but only natural light, such as a fire, not artificial light. Flashlights do nothing but edge on its curiosity, the old man said while opening up a plastic cooler. So I guess my leg was eaten by the time you were able to save me? I asked as I examined my fake limb. The man took something out of the cooler and turned toward me. He was holding a leg when he said, No, my pet out there gets the scraps. I get the tender parts. <laughs>